Hi. Um, I would like to pretend that I'm reading from my laptop because I'm so environmentally conscious and um, good, but actually it's because I never finish in time to actually print out a presentation, ever. Um, about a million years ago when I was in graduate school, uh, one of my colleagues came in one day and she said, what happened last night? Some missionaries from your church knocked on my door and they started talking about how you could be with your family forever. Like that was a good thing. <laughs> Um, an, a novice to uh, transhumanist thinking and writing can have a little bit the same response. They're talking about human beings becoming smarter and living longer, as if that was a good thing. <laughs> um, most of us are lucky enough to have experiences that help us imagine why one might want to live with one's family forever, although some of us will also uh, know why one might not want to. Um, I want to think carefully today about why we might want to be smarter or live longer, um, and about how that why should matter. And since I know uh, far less than, mo no, than all of you about transhumanism, I want to start about talking some things I might know more about than some of you, uh, German literature and music and depression. Um, go ahead and make all the jokes you want about the potential <laughs> causal links between those two, <laughs> or three. Um, first, let's see, Baroque music. Um, and I'm going to go backwards. Uh, one of the features of Baroque music, the one that we usually think of as defining the genre, is ornamentation. Singers and instrumentalists were licensed and encouraged to augment what was written in the score with trills and mordens and appoggiaturas and doppelt cadences and accents and all kinds of other things that you see notated there. Um, but all of this happened above the basso continuo, or figured bass, which was a very strict system by which, um, actually this picture is too blurry for you to see it, but above the, the uh, bottom score, you can see numbers. And those um, quite strictly define the, the chord progression that has to come out and how the, the bass line should progress uh, through a piece. Um, the history of this form of accompaniment is, is what I want to think about today. It's almost certain that this strict and independent bass line arose as a means of coordinating polychoral works, that is, um, works that were composed for two or more choirs, usually for especially festive occasions, or sometimes to highlight architectural features of churches. They'd place choirs in all the niftiest spots in the building, and then they'd all sing together, and people would look around at the building. Um, but in order to keep that together, they'd have instrumentalists in the center that um, at first were just doubling the choral parts, and, uh, and those parts would be all written out precisely for the instrumentalists the way that they were for the singers. Um, and, and they kept the, the celebration from flying apart. Um, Eventually, the basso continuo, which supported and augmented the other vocal in, or instrumental parts instead of merely doubling them, um, developed and, and this form of, of just notating briefly the form of the chord with a number uh, allowed a sort of freedom in, within the form that, uh, that eventually made it possible for the, the bass to not just uh, keep keep things together, but to provide enough of an underlying texture that you could have a solo instrument or um, a solo singer doing all kinds of interesting melodic things, but with enough oomph from the, from the bass to, to make it sound rich. Um, I think if this works, we might even be able to hear some of it. Um, let's see. No. Okay, well, we don't have to. You guys have all heard the Bach Easter Oratorio, right? Anybody want to sing it? <laughs> um, okay. Don't worry, you have to sing later, later on in this presentation, so. Whoops, where am I? Okay, thanks. There it is, I think you can hear the bass. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a humanist. I don't do this stuff. Um, it's all right. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll get back. 
um, you can imagine. You've, you've heard enough Bach to know, you know, the singers doing their trills and the, and the bass going neatly. Um, so ultimately, the, um, uh, the possibilities opened by having this independent and predictable bass line led to monodic forms of music that could support a soloist. That leads to cantatas that incorporate soloists as well as new chorale forms, and eventually to opera and sort of everything that comes after that. Um, those forms eventually become too rich and complicated for figured bass to fully realize. And so the more complex orchestrations of the classical and subsequent musical styles require, once again, a fully notated part for the bass instruments along with the rest of the orchestra and chorus. So there's this wonderful progress of musical innovation and celebration outstripping the extant forms developing new forms, and then again overflowing those new forms and reaching back for the old forms, newly understood, which give expression to new ideas. Um, we could, if we were being sweeping and grandiose and oversimplifying a lot, trace a similar progression in literature. Um, the German Baroque um, literature becomes obsessed both with form and with breaking that form at the same time. Um, this is a, a passage from the opening of one chapter of Martin Opitz's book, das, das Buch der Deutschen Poeterei, which was sort of the first, um, first attempt at codifying a German literary theory. Um, he, uh, he starts off by, by saying um, this, uh, well, with this statement, he says, although I've taken it upon myself at the request of other noble-minded people to say something about German poetics, and through that to better propagate our language. Yet I am not of the opinion that somebody may be turned into a poet by means of rules and regulations. So he is at least humble about his project. But uh, his project is essentially, he says, that uh, he's going to describe the purpose of poetry and its historical and cultural context. Uh, he's going to give a typology of poetry, giving the genres and their most appropriate applications. He's going to define poetic style. Uh, he's going to iterate rhyme and meter with examples of the sonnet and ode and verse forms. And he prescribes the use of alexandrines as opposed to the low form of knittelvers, which is this older German um, rhyming verse of four iambic feet. Um, he thinks there should be strict adherence to meter measured by the natural stress in the word, the use of pure rhyme only, and the absolute exclusion of foreign words. So um, despite his uh, belief that you can't make a poet out of um, rules and regulations. He, he does his best to, to um, make enough rules that, that one could become a poet. Um, he, um, he, does all, he achieves all those aims in a book that's about 20 pages <laughs> long, um, which uh, German literature students really appreciate since later people take lots more pages to do that. Um, at the same time, or just a few years after Opus's book was published, came this uh, novel called uh, Der Abenteuerliche, Abenteuerliche Simplicissimus. Um, say that three times fast. Um, and this is the first, depending on who you ask, it's, it's the first Bildungsroman, or it's a sort of proto-Bildungsroman, uh, the, the form that be, becomes that. And it takes as the the major plot device, the development of a single character, which is a, a new thing. So this, this guy, this Abenteuerliche Simplicissimus, Abenteuerliche means um, adventuresome, this adventuresome, odd, odd um, gesture sort of going through life. And it, it makes comments on politics and social convention and all kinds of things, but all through the lens of this sort of innocent guy bumbling through the world and becoming less naive and more sophisticated. Um, this, this idea, even though it's, it's um, loose and kind of, uh, when you read this book, it just seems like it's uh, episodic. It's just a, a, a bunch of stories, um, even sort of fanciful tales. But, but this seeing a series of things through the eyes of one character is, is new-ish, at least in German literature at that point. And it becomes, you know, of course, as we know, the, the form for most novels, right, character-driven um, describes many novels, and it's, it's even the forerunner of what we have in the sort of declining form of the novel as the memoir, right? Um, so we can thank or blame uh, Simplicissimus for that. Um, but there, 
form is exploded. Um, there's no, there's, there's nothing that rhymes. There's no structure to the story. None of the conventions of um, books up until that time are observed, and um, it's it's very exciting. It sort of catches uh, German writers and and all of the um, 18th and 19th century. Everybody reads this. Everybody refers to it. It's a sort of seminal moment in in German literature, and recognized as a moment where, despite the interest and obsession with with form and with German language and um, privileging the vernacular. Everything opens up. Everything is open um, at that moment, and so, um, and that leads to sort of everything that comes after, in much the same way that the figured base um, both explodes the form and then reforms and and leads to to big things afterwards. Uh, the next sort of moment in German literature that people know about is Sturm und Drang, uh, which is the precursor of uh, Romanticism. And uh, it's, it's Goethe taking this form of simplicissimus to its, its logical extreme and, and creating this character who is all feeling and no rationality and no forethought and no um, social convention. And this guy named Werther wears clothes that are um, wildly unconventional. He wears yellow pants, which is, um, for some reason, just wildly um, uh, uh, what's the word? Just it's it's wildly provocative for Germans. These yellow pants and his, his blue blazer, um, and he is desperately in love and uh, kills himself because he just can't stand the overflowing of his feelings. And um, and this leads, um, believe it or not, to a rash of suicides of young German men in yellow pants. It's um, it's, it's actually becomes a a real problem. Um, so this this overflowing of feeling it, it's it's a thing, um, and it, this this is the precursor the the introduction the beginning of romanticism, uh, which uh, at one point Friedrich Schlegel, who's considered sort of the found the the father of of German romanticism, is asked uh, by a friend to to send him a definition of romanticism and he says I can't it's 125 pages long and um, that I guess wouldn't fit in the mail back in the day um, but a few years later he did manage to um, uh, write this succinct definition of um, what romantic poetry was trying to be succinct ish um, so this is for those of you who read German because it's really fun and great, but um, here's a sort of loose translation. Uh, romantic poetry is a progressive universal poetry. Her task is not only to reunify all of the sundered forms of poetry and to bring poetry into communion with philosophy and rhetoric. It will and should also blend, even meld, poetry and prose, appreciation and criticism, art poetry and nature poetry, to make living poetry living and social, and to make life and society poetic. It should poetize humor and fill and satisfy the forms of art with all the stuff of life itself. It should contain everything in a system of art, down to the sigh, the kiss that the child author breathes out in her artless song. Other forms of writing are finished and can now only be completely dismembered. But the romantic form is still becoming. Its mode of being is that it is eternally becoming, can never be complete. It cannot be exhausted by any theory. So there's this sense that everything that has come before is spent, is inadequate to the overflowing feeling and the life force of these new Wunderkinder. And yet, um, despite rebelling against formalist classicism, the Romantics ended up needing form too. They turned to folk music and folk tales and fairy tales, which they saw as somehow less artificial than other kinds of art. Um, but what's interesting here is the sense apparently present in almost every new artistic moment that tries to define itself that life and life feeling have somehow, um, sorry, just skipped a page, or six, um, have, have somehow overflowed the conventional forms, that the new generation's sorrows and joys and loves or appreciation of beauty have somehow escaped the bounds of the expressive forms that everyone else knew before them. It's this moment of excess and abundance that I want us to notice. Um, this discussion of excessive feeling in German literature leads us, of course, to the topic of depression. Um, Andrew Solomon, the uh, great uh, writer who wrote The Noonday Demon, which is 
the most beautiful and optimistic book you will ever read about depression, um, says that uh, depression is the flaw in love. To be creatures who love, we must be creatures who can despair at what we lose. Life is fraught with sorrows. We are, each of us, held in the solitude of an autonomous body. Time passes. What has been will never be again. Pain is the first experience of world helplessness. I know he must have studied German at some point. Nobody else would put world helplessness together as a compound word. Um, and it never leaves us. Perhaps depression can be best described as emotional pain that forces itself upon us against our will and then breaks free of its externals. Grief is depression in proportion to circumstance. Depression is grief out of proportion to circumstance. I'm interested um, here in this notion of feeling, um, in this case pain, that escapes its externals and um, becomes disproportionate. Um, Solomon doesn't really, um, doesn't explain um, where it is he derives this sense of what the what the proportion to circumstance would be. What, what does it mean to have grief in proportion or out of proportion to circumstance? Why do we have this sense that, that feeling should somehow correspond on some scale um, to our experience? I mean, we, we do. I think we walk around with this sense. And a lot of the time when we're unhappy, it's because we think we're not feeling the right way for what's going on around us. But, but where, where do we have that, that notion of coincidence? Um, but, but there is here in Solomon's um, comparison of grief and depression this assumption that there's a proper proportion of circumstance and feeling and that we get into trouble when there's an excess of feeling, when grief slips out of the cultural occasions and rituals we have created to contain it. Um, but what, what makes us afraid um, then or fearful or in pain is not, um, not the fear of death. He talks about how you know, if, if we are going to love, then we are going to be afraid of death because death will take away the, the things that we love. Um, but it's not really death that, that is the problem here, but the, the surface, the surfeit of love, this excess of feeling whose expression we cannot contain. Um, in Goethe's Faust, to return for a second to German, um, to stuff I know, um, the, 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 uh, the thing that is going to, make him become human again, to lose his bet with the devil that makes him omnipotent, is if, he's, if he experiences a moment that he enjoys so much, that he loves so much, that he asks for the moment to stay. Verweile doch, du bist so schön. And, and if he says that to a moment of human expression, of human love, then he will lose his exalted status that he's gained by bargaining with the devil. So there's there's this sense that that capturing that moment that of intense feeling is the thing that that makes us most human. Um, but we all labor under this idea that somehow there's a correct proportion of life and feeling and that if we could just keep things in equilibrium and, and not be overcome by um, that excess of feeling, we'd, we'd, everything would be fine. Um, then again, maybe it's not all of us who, who want that equilibrium. Um, writers, especially poets and musicians, are all about this excess of feeling. It's their stock in trade. And um, one of the most common responses to the excess of feeling is either to try to invent a new form or explode an old one, to make room for this abundance of sentiment that they always think is the new discovery of their generation. Um, of course, it's not right. Jesus, even in the you know a couple of millennia ago, talks about the idea that that new wine and old bottles don't go together. Um, but there's what's constant is this felt need to capture the part of humanity of humanness that's always overflowing. Um, human art is always after this excess of meaning and capturing it in a way that can be communicated. Most of the time, words are inadequate are as inadequate as sonata form for this kind of communication. So we reach for metaphor and even for synesthesia, the sort of conflation of, of various senses. Um, Billy Collins lampoons this tendency in his delightful poem, Litany, um, which you probably all know, but I'm going to read because comic relief is necessary uh, in disquisitions about German literature. Um, his poem is called uh, Litany, and it starts off with a quotation from somebody named Jacques Criquillon, who, who says, you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. And then Collins says, you are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. 
You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel of the sun. You are the white apron of the baker and the marsh birds suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter, or the house of cards. And you are certainly not the pine scented air. There is just no way that you are the pine scented air. <laughs> it's possible that you are the fish under the bridge, maybe even the pigeon on the general's head, but you are not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. And a quick look in the mirror will show that you are neither the boots in the corner nor the boat asleep in its boathouse. It might interest you to know, speaking of the plentiful imagery of the world, that I am the sound of rain on the roof. I also happen to be the shooting star, the evening paper blowing down an alley, and the basket of chestnuts on the kitchen table. I am also the moon in the trees and the blind woman's teacup. But don't worry, I am not the bread in the knife. You are still the bread and the knife. <laughs> you will always be the bread and the knife. Not to mention the crystal goblet and, somehow, the wine. Um, so, like art, uh, religion is concerned with these moments of excess, with the places where human feeling seems to escape its proper bounds. In the religious context, we, call it, we often call it transcendence, without really quite specifying what it is we are transcending. The ordinary, the normal, the proportional, or dreaded favorite word of Mormons, the appropriate. Um, unlike art, religion doesn't usually try to explain or express this excess in human terms. It attributes excess to the divine, makes it originate outside of the human heart, or postpones its iteration to an afterlife. And this is the moment where I, I, I might, if I'm feeling really brave, try to get you. Who sings in here? You're all, you're all, we can sing this, right? All right, who's got perfect pitch? Anybody got an F? Of course you do. Of course you have a pitch pipe. <laughs> okay, so can you see? All right? All right, I'll lead. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Don't sing like Mormons, sing faster. Dwelling of thy faithful mercy's crown. Jesus, thou art our compassion, pure and bound with love thou art. I knew you could do it. Um, so that, that's romanticism in a religious context, right? This moment of being lost in wonder, love, and praise. That's, that's, how, we, that's how we do religious excess of feeling, right? Um, 
the title of my talk, uh, well, let's just say religion calls this excess of feeling miraculous. It's really interesting that, that Micah talked about miracles because you, you can see where we're, where we're going here. Um, and, but it, we, religion calls the inexplicable miraculous and leaves it at that, right? The title of my talk comes from a poem of um, Richard Wilbur, who was a, a professor at Wesleyan University for a long time. And I think this perfectly captures the impulse of religion to deal with excess as miracle. It says, St. John tells how at Cana's wedding feast, the water pots poured wine in such amount that by his sober count, there were a hundred gallons at the least. It made no earthly sense unless to show how whatsoever love elects to bless brims to a sweet excess that can without depletion overflow, which is to say that what love sees is true, that this world's fullness is not made but found. Life hungers to abound and pour out its plenty for such as you. Um, of course, as many transhumanist thinkers have been at pains to point out, religion is not just about what to do with a surfeit of happiness and love. It excuses all excesses of feeling, including anger, vengefulness, and lust, with reference to extra human beings, the devil made me do it, or worse, God told me to do it, as justification for slavery, sexism, even genocide. Religious attempts to cope with and suppress perceived excesses of feeling or feelings that are unusual or difficult have a long history of provoking tribalism, persecution, inquisition, and war. Um, so these moments of, of feeling, of feeling escaping, um, demand attention. And it seems to me that um, in preferring the rational over the emotional, and preferring the secular to the religious um, among transhumanists, that 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 we miss something important, that we that we elide questions that that have to be answered somehow. Um, and so far, at least no form, either literary or musical or artistic or scientific, has managed to describe the human experience in a way that doesn't leave a remainder, a little bit left of life's hunger to abound seems to me that whether we find that remainder frustrating or joyous will make an enormous difference in the rational systems and practices we try to create. Do we want to improve the human condition because we find death too fearsome to bear? Or is it because we believe that love can cast out that fear? Um, this is the embarrassing point in my talk where I confess that I am so ignorant of the state of play in transhumanist thought that I initially turned to Wikipedia to map out a crash course for myself. Uh, one helpful page listed several works of fiction that might be considered transhumanist, along with helpful one-line summaries of their major plot lines or themes. Several of the suggested books were described as, quote, utopia or dystopia, depending on your point of view. <laughs> now, far be it from me, the token humanist, to cast stones here, but that struck me as decidedly unsciency and actually provided a port of entry for me into this unfamiliar work. I was looking for ways that point of view might matter in um, transhumanist thought projects or, experience, or experiments. Um, there's a moment in Margaret Atwood's A Handmaid's Tale, and I know you're all going to tell me in the Q&A that that's not really transhumanism, and it's, it's okay. Um, but there's this moment where the protagonist is speaking with one of the overlords of the dystopia, and he reveals the fundamental rationale by which well-intentioned people had managed to make life a living hell for most of the population, particularly the female half of the population, but for most of everyone. Um, towards the end of the novel, the narrator of Fred has seduced her commander into an illicitly and dangerously humane relationship. They do things like playing Scrabble and reading me magazines together and most dangerous of all, just talking. Eventually, she gets him to tell her about why and how the world changed from the one she remembered, which was roughly um, life in the 80s or 90s in a medium-sized post-feminist American city. And his chilling explana explanation is this. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. We thought we could do it better, but better never means better for everyone. It always means worse for some. And that, I think, is a fundamental dividing line between utopia and dystopia. Is life, is goodness scarce or abundant? Everything depends on how we answer this question. Do we want to live longer and be smarter because we sense life's hunger to abound or because we are afraid of death? Are we trying to multiply joy or merely escape grief? 
it seems to me that Mormonism has particularly rich strains of both impulses, the fear of death and the longing for life to continue in its overflowing goodness. We don't need to look farther than the founding prophet Joseph Smith for an embodied lesson in how these feelings coexist even in the same consciousness. Uh, Samuel Brown has poignantly argued that earliest Mormonism was compelled and even obsessed with death. Um, he quotes Joseph Smith at a funeral sermon for Adam Marks saying, all men know that all men must die. What is the object of our coming into existence, then falling away to be here no more? This is a subject we ought to study more than any other, which we ought to study day and night. He expressed similar um, sentiments on many occasions. His funeral sermons were the locus of much of Joseph's most elaborate theological work. Sometimes he seemed to want to keep the feelings evoked by the contemplation of death bounded in some sort of rational proportion, faithful to the religious reasoning he was working out. So he said at another funeral, when we lose a near and dear friend upon whom we have set our hearts, it should be a caution to us not to set our affections too firmly upon others, knowing that they may in like manner be taken from us. Our affection should be placed upon God and his work more intensely than our, on our fellow beings. But then he contradicts himself again, right? Of course, you all know the um, place in the Doctrine and Covenants where he says that we should live together in love in so much that we shall weep, weep for those who, are, who mourn. So like most of us, Joseph wasn't entirely ab able to pull off the equanimity he believed his religious convictions ought to provide. In yet another funeral sermon for Jesse Barnes, he said, when I heard of the death of our beloved brother Barnes, it would not have affected me so much if I had the opportunity of burying him in the land of Zion. I have said, Father, I desire to die here among the saints, but if this is not thy will and I go hence and die, wilt thou find some kind friend to bring my body back and gather up my friends who have fallen in foreign lands and bring them up hither that we may all lie together? And may we contemplate these things so? Yes, if we learn how to live and how to die. When we lie down, we contemplate how we may rise in the morning, and it is pleasing for friends to lie down together, locked in the arms of love, to sleep and wake in each other's embrace and renew their conversation. So there his, his yearning for um, the earthly, the physical, the, the actual togetherness of friends sort of escapes the, the notion that, um, that death um, would, would take people away. He, he, can't, he can't ultimately bear it, even though he, he um, tries to. Um, his human affection and care for his friends, and especially for his family, constantly overflowed the bounds of the religious forms he was creating. Um, see, for instance, these accounts of his feelings when he organized the church and baptized his own father. Um, these are really beautiful. I hope you can see that. Um, so this is from um, Lucy Mack Smith's account of uh, the founding of the church. And the part on the left is her unpublished manuscript. And then the, the, the version on the right is the one that she published. But look at the parts that, that don't appear in the published version. She says, Joseph stood on the shore when his father came out of the water. And as he took him by the hand, he cried out, oh my God, I have lived to see my father baptized into the true church of Jesus Christ. And he covered his face and wept and um, and sobbed upon his father's bosom like a child, um, wept aloud for joy, as Joseph of old when he became, beheld his father coming up into the land of Egypt. Um, and then in the uh, diary of Joseph Knight, he says, there's one thing I will mention that evening that old brother Smith and Martin Harris was baptized. Joseph was filled to the spirit to a great degree to see his father and Mr. Harris that he had been with so much. He burst out with great with grief and joy and seemed as though the world could not hold him. He went out into the lot and appeared to want to get out of sight of everybody and would sob and cry and seemed to be so full that he could not live. Oliver and I went after him and came to him and after a while he came in, but he was the most wrought upon that I ever saw any man. His joy seemed to be full. Um, so while Joseph would go on to try to systematize and codify the enduring familial frameworks for human affection, I love these accounts of the founding moment of the Mormon church. Already in his first attempt to make a religious system and ordinances out of his revelatory experiences, Joseph complicated affection for his father, completely overflows the bounds of decorum and even of language. It seems to me that Mormonism has, ever since that moment, existed in a constant struggle between the need to systematize and organize a church, create a religion, 
and the equally urgent need to imbue these reasoned and appropriate forms of religious expression with the kinds of transcendent, messy, sobbing joy that overwhelmed Joseph when he baptized, baptized his father. It seems to me that we are and have been for a few decades in a Mormon moment where the comfort of systems and rules and authority, as Christopher was talking about, has, has mostly overtaken the longing for the uncontainable excess that also inheres in Mormonism's optimistic insistence on human beings' expansive and even godly potentialities. I find a delicious and uh, sort of provocative irony in the ways that the Mormon Transhumanist Project, though itself eager and optimistic about technological and scientific modes of systematizing, also might um, rediscover the exuberant and adventuresome spirit that animated these earliest Mormons of Mormonism. Uh, like the romantic poets trying to dismember the old forms in order to reanimate them, the ideas that you are pursuing can be constructive and invigorating to the old forms of Mormonism. Um, but turning away uh, for a second from Mormonism, I want to close with a practical exam example of how working in a framework of abundance might change real world events and practice. Um, many of you will have seen this news report in the last couple of days. Um, this, I'm going to just read it from the Smithsonian Magazine's blog. Um, why would scientists revive a thousand-year-old medical recipe for a foul-smelling concoction? They suspected it could have very real benefits, and it turns out they were right. An Anglo-Saxon brew kills methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. Uh, when microbiologist Freya Harrison chatted with Christina Lee, an Anglo-Saxon medievalist, she was intrigued by a nasty-sounding recipe in Bald's Leech Book, a thousand-year-old compendium of medical advice and, proportion and potions. The recipe uh, was recommended to fight infected eyelash follicles. Um, involves crop leek and garlic of equal quantities. Take wine and bullock skull mixed with the leek. Let stand nine days in the brass vessel, etc. cetera. Um, <laughs> and so intrigued by this possibility, they actually uh, made up a batch of this stuff. And <laughs> let it sit in the lab for nine days and then uh, tried it out on some MRSA uh, bacteria on uh, mouse skin and it killed about 90 percent of it which is as good or better than the rate uh, for the the best uh, conventional antibiotics we have now we often speak in university and medical and technological contexts of of scarcity right we, we cut funding to arts and humanities in favor of stem fields and that seems like a pretty rational thing to do um, there's you know science is practical it they make stuff. And, you know, I love a lot of medievalists, but most of the time what they do seems as practical as an extended Monty Python sketch, right? Which is not to say that it's useless. The world would be impoverished without them. Um, we need the irrational and exuberant abundance of the useless, the silly, the impractical, the religious, the kiss that the child poet breathes out in her artless song both our religious striving towards salvation and our scientific, technological, transhumanist striving towards better lives here and now depend on whether or not we are able to believe that better can, in fact, mean better for everyone, that life hungers to abound and pour out its plenty, such, uh, pour its plenty out for such as you and for all of us, for the most expansive definition of us that we can conceive. Otherwise, I can just make you sing some more. I've got <laughs> that was fun. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Um, I this is my seventh year of editing a dialogue. I'm almost done. Boyd Peterson will take over next year, and um, subscriptions have um, have increased slightly, um, really slightly over the last um, o over that time period, um, which in an age when most print publications are are uh, falling precipitously feels pretty good. Um, I think uh, the trouble that we and uh, you know, most print publications are facing is that um, people don't read. Um, 
long form anything anymore. Um, and the other interesting thing is that I think um, Dialogue and Sunstone and, and some of those independent publications for a long time um, served a, a function that was outside of their content, that was external to their content, and we didn't really realize it. But, but what Dialogue said over and over and over again to people as it arrived in the mailbox was, you're not alone. Um, and, and that was really the most important content of Dialogue for decades, I think. And, um, and that message is now available online all the time, you know, 24 hours a day in whatever, um, you know, constellation or ideological flavor you would like it. And, and blogs just do that community function much better. So um, it's, it, uh, it's, been, it's been interesting to try to sort of find our way into those sort of short form conversations and try to say, well, yes, but you know, actually this, this wheel you're reinventing, someone else built a really good one about 25 years ago and you could just go over here and read it. So, um, you know, I think we're facing mostly the same, the same struggles that most um, print publications are. And I, I see it as a problem of form, not so much of ideology. I, I feel like um, ideologically the church is, that the, the climate in Mormonism is, is good for, for what we're trying to do at Dialogue and Print. Yes, is that? Uh, one, two, three. <laughs> so, uh, I, your message of uh, teaching from the church and from the uh, Mormons is important to some of us. And I'm wondering um, if that teaching is applicable in this everyday life of a small group of Mormons. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's easy. Um, <laughs> oh, sure. Um, yeah, he he just asked me how to um, how to uh, deal with the problem of Earth's scarce resources um, in in ten words or less, basically. Um, so, or, or, and how that conflicts with this idea that there is abundance, right? With you know it, the the Mormon way to say it is that there is enough and to spare. Um, I think that. Um, most of our greediest, most destructive consumption um, comes out of this sense that there's not enough and that we better grab all we can and then some more, just in case. Um, and it, uh, it seems to me that, at least in my own life, when I really am operating, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that I do this with physical resources. I'm thinking now more in terms of feeling and um, but I, I think it works. I think it translates into the physical world that um, that when I'm uh, less worried about getting more stuff and more grateful, I mean, the, the paradigm of abundance, right, leads to a sense of gratitude and, and fullness. And when you have that sense of fullness, then you don't need stuff to fill up the empty spaces. And um, I mean, that's a really sort of facile um, gloss. but. But I do think that, that most of the sort of most destructive Western consumption comes from this sense of trying to fill a lack somehow um, with, with stuff that ultimately doesn't feel, fill it and that leads to more and more consumption. So just breaking out of that paradigm, I think, maybe would go a long ways. Thanks. Um, and that is the concept, and also 
I invite Lincoln to say maybe this is actually what the mission of the MTA is and other sort of things. One of the things that I really despair of, and I live in Northern California myself, is um, when I see, uh, I'll just call them the curse wilds, um, who, are, who have the means and the determination to work on the technological underpinnings that could be the basis for this journey that we're on. Um, very often I see personalities, that is the ones in the, in the commanding positions with the most resource, uh, personalities that I, are really foreign to me. Um, it, it spawns the question that you asked in the very beginning, is this a good thing? And, and so most of the books that I've read, and I've read quite a few, um, when they come to saying, you know, and what will we do once we become immortal and data and so on? And, and one of the books that I recently read by Martin Rothblatt says, well, of course, there will still be movies. After all, they'll all be there. And so you'll want to get together with your cyber friend information code package evolving and watch movies. And what else do you like to do? Do you like to play cards? Sure, you could do that. And she lists like a dozen things that, I mean, are you know, like going bowling, you know, I don't know. And that's it, that's what you can come up with. So it seems that the people who are working on it often have an emotional depth. And I, I don't mean this insulting to anybody who's experienced this, but which is close to autistic. There's no there there. There's a fascination with procedure. There's a fascination with process. There's an assumption that we simply want more of this stuff, which my son is flying right now in a hotel. And, and so I, is it the mission of groups like this to actually try to inform things that don't pay? <laughs> because there is no shortage, believe me, of IT workers. People who say we need more. No, we've got a billion of them. And they all do the same thing. It's, a, it's called apps. They live in apps world. And they get funding for that. And we're trying to find people who want to do things like spread emotional wealth. There's no market for it. But we're saying, but that's the best thing that we could do with this stuff. So are what we're saying in this conference is that we're announcing that that is the point and that we're trying to find a way to leverage this minority viewpoint, which often doesn't have a lot of power and money. Is that what this is? Should it be Christine? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I'm going to mostly defer to Lincoln because you are way out of my depth there. But um, but I'll just say that that maybe um, maybe the mission ought to be to. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> great. Great. Okay. Um, so. Um, the question was about sort of the, the personalities, maybe leaders in the transhumanist movement, people who have the resources and the technical skill to make some of these things happen, seem sometimes to not have an emotionally or spiritually rich vision of, of what they're trying to create, that they're fascinated by the technological possibilities and sometimes lose sight of the humanist ones. Is that fair? Okay. Um, and I, I think um, that that maybe the the right approach to that question is not to not to try and um, proselytize to people whose temperaments are different than ours, but um, but to just make room for more for more kinds of people to you know do insane things like inviting me here to, to give this talk and you know getting me thereby to you know watch a bunch of Kurzweil. TED Talks and, um, you know, learn a little bit about this stuff and, and see if there's a way in for, for other kinds of visions. You know, make sure that the medievalist is talking to the microbiologist.
All right, there's another one. Let's be, be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's the only place that word exists in the English language. It's so great. Okay, so um, let me try to restate that one. So um, language is insufficient. We can't really articulate the most important spiritual truths of our lives like atonement in, in language. We, we reach for words like infinite and incomprehensible, um, supernal, to describe this thing because we, we can't translate it into practical terms. And, um, and and I, I seemed to be arguing, and I think I was, that um, that it's good anyway to, to keep reaching for these for these terms, um, and and why. So what what do we get from from still trying to express to f the ineffable, as it were, right? Um, to uh, you know to to say the thing that can't be said. Um, uh, so. Um, I think we let me let me uh, Joseph Smith talked once about trying to escape the narrow, crooked prison of words. And um, he had this sense all the time, and you I, I think in the Doctrine and Covenants you read it all the time that he's sort of he he says over and you know, we saw these things, we can't record them, we we don't under in the Book of Mormon, you know, all these things that, that can't be uttered. And um but we have to try, right? I mean, that's how we're built as humans, so that's why we do metaphors. That's why, um, you know, Billy Collins laughs at at the ways that we talk to our beloved. But we still do it, and it means something to us. We like hearing those metaphors, and so um, I, I think it's just that that language is is all we have. I mean, we we can reckon, and part of what um, the Romantics offer that's useful is to say language isn't going, you know, to, to just acknowledge that the form, the form won't hold and that, um, that, that we're always aiming at something uh, too big, um, for us to manage. Um, I actually think that maybe the Baroque is a better, um, a better example. Um, you know, there are these moments and I here, I'm going to be lost for words too, but, uh, many of you probably know this experience of, um, listening or I have it most often when playing um, Bach where you know it's a it's a perfect fugue there's nothing there's nothing outside of the form and yet all of a sudden there's this space that opens up in that melody that just um, it and I don't know how to describe it other than that a sort of space that happens between between the bars between the the rigid Form, that there's just suddenly this sense of expansion and um, I think I think that's why we keep reaching for better words to describe what we're trying to do we're hoping that eventually we'll come on the form that that escapes itself um, and and lets us feel that space in in the form um, but yeah I, <laughs> sorry I'm, I, I don't know <laughs> Yeah. 
Right. The, yeah, that we need more more forms, an abundance of, of forms, and eventually we get something like what we need. <laughs>